Peter Bick is a documentary uh, filmmaker as well as a professor, and uh, he has a really interesting take on the regenerative agriculture and experienced it through a different lens. That of, you know, not of a farmer, but of somebody that's really passionate about sharing the messages. So enjoy my visit with Peter Bick. Peter, thank you so much for jumping on here. I have been an admirer of your work for a while. Uh, Carbon Cowboys, it just kind of set the tone for, I think, the movement, man. You've uh, you've created a lot of awareness. So how how did you get interested in regenerative agriculture? Well, first, Logan, it's great to be here, and thank you for your kind words. Um, for me, it came through uh, concern about climate change. I made a movie called Carbon Nation that came out in 2010. And of all the solutions I was finding, and a lot of times we didn't care if someone believed in climate change or not. They were just doing cool stuff. And uh, we found these farmers doing this amazing stuff. And I met Alan Williams in 2012 because the guy who narrated Carbon Nation, Bill Curtis, knew Alan. And he said, if you want to learn about grazing, call Alan. So that's my ground zero for this. And uh, Alan and I spoke on the phone. And I'm like, hey, I need to make a movie about this. I want to... I want to inspire McDonald's and Walmart to to put this kind of meat in their stores. And so I filmed Alan in uh, June of 2013, maybe May of 2013. And then I went up and got Neil Dennis in August and then Gabe in August and of 2013. And we finished that film at the end of the year and we had our world premiere down in uh, Johannesburg. So that short film, Soil Carbon Cowboys, started everything for me too, man. Um it was right when I got to Arizona State University. I teach documentary filmmaking here. And we must have shown that film hundreds of times in all sorts of companies, just educating, 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 educating. And and we wanted to make sure there was research on this stuff. Richard Teague was the only one researching this type of grazing, which was a big hole in the research. And so we put the team together. And so that's the work that I'm working on now. And we've got this docu-series that's just finished up called Roots So Deep. You can see the devil down there. And and of course, Alan's on the team. Alan's in there. It's about our science team. It's about these farmers all over the Southeast US who are either doing adaptive grazing or our neighbors of folks doing adaptive grazing. And we just spend time, spend years with folks just to see, how, what do you think? You know, and and then we share the data after years. So that's that's what I've been working on this whole decade. As we've made all those short films, we've been working on this big project too. I love how you're coming at it from a different angle, from that uh, you know the university, the education research angle. That is just incredible. Um, Alan was actually my first uh, guest that gave me any sort of credibility to reach out to the sure. other others to uh, jump on. So Alan holds a special place in my heart for in a for, lot of people's hearts, my friend. A- absolutely. But He's I, one that's of the heroes. He is. A, he absolutely is. I think, I think all of them are so genuine though. And that's, what's really blown my mind with how personable and kind and passionate about what they do Mm -hmm. is yeah and 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 available right you know i remember talking to gabe when we were filming him and he was telling me how many people asked him to speak and how he's going everywhere and inviting people i said did you ever charge anyone for your speaking engagements he goes no i wouldn't do that and i'm like gabe i think you might want to think about that (laughs) and i think he has thought about that maybe not just because i mentioned it but you know they were just given 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 they're givers they are. I think that's why they uh, are so dear to so many people is, yeah. is simply because of that. Yeah. So where I have seen a uh, a lot of excitement is in this awareness and through through your work, what do you see as the reflection or what what is the result of putting this out there? Well, you know, people never really thought about soil in any kind of like big company way, people weren't thinking about soil. I mean, you know, we were filming farmers in Canada that were the first organic ranchers in Canada and they had never looked at their soil. Even folks with that kind of awareness and conscientiousness about regenerative agriculture. So I think, I think 
with the films, we've helped bring awareness to soil, right? And then the idea that cows could be part of the solution is, boy, that's hard for some folks to get their head around, right? And so, and some folks are fighting back hard on that, really hard on that. And, you know, that's why we did the data. We wanted to find out, you know, is this a solution? And, and we knew it was good for the farmers. That was never a question. But is it good for wildlife? Is it good for water infiltration? Is it, is it good for the farmer's economics, right? You could really dig into that. Is it good for the environment, you know, the rural economy, right? Is it good for the rural economy? Is it good for the water cycling in that community beyond the farm? And is it good for greenhouse gas cycling? Is it good for the planet? And so that's what the research we've been working on. And that's, that's what's in our documentary series. So, you know, we all, we love it if folks come out to rootsodeep.org and check us out. It's, we're screening live screenings around the country right now. We call it our hometown roadshow. And so we, we were at Alan Williams Church in, in uh, Starkville a couple months ago. And um, then we were at Ann Demarath's Church in Missouri last month. And, you know, universities, companies, and uh, we'll make it available for rental online at our website. We're thinking April. That's kind of what we're looking at right now. So folks can see see it when they want to. But right now it's go to our site, request a screening, and that's where we go. So Peter, when you're doing these hometown shows, like what is, uh, what's the community saying? What's that feedback? The feedback has been a dream. You know, it's been a dream because we get the adaptive farmers, the regenerative farmers, they know some of the information in our documentary or they feel it, you know, or they know something's right and they just, to then see other people doing it makes them feel part of a community, which is important, right? You don't want to feel like you're alone. And then the conventional farmers that are coming to our screenings, a light bulb goes off and they say, I just didn't know. And we found that in our research. Folks just aren't being taught this stuff at scale. And so what, a a what Gabe is doing, what Alan's doing, what all those folks are doing is changing that but now how do we change it beyond uh, a Soil Health Academy you know, week with 500 people there? How do we get it to 5,000, 50,000 people learning about it at that same time? And so that's, that's our goals now is like, how do we really scale this up? Because farmers are smart. Farmers care about their land. And if they just haven't been shown a few things, it's no fault of theirs. It might be the fault of the educational system. It might even be that entity's fault, right? This is new stuff for some people. It's not new stuff, but it's new stuff for a lot of people. Um, and so we just want to help get the word out so farmers can make a decision, you know, an educated decision. Peter, help me understand why, why you're passionate about spreading the awareness. Like why, why do you as, as an educator feel that the, we need to get the message out there. Well, like I said, I, I came at this through climate change. That was my entry, right? But as I've met farmers over the last 10, 11 years, I feel like I'm as much an advocate for farmers as, as I am concerned about climate change. I am concerned about farmers because uh, the debt they're carrying and the stress they're carrying is real. And these are the folks producing our food. I don't want them cutting corners. I want them making money and 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 having a good life i i know most farmers have off farm jobs and a lot of farmers have off farm jobs because they need health insurance right so why can't we give farmers health insurance through the farm bill we're spending billions and billions and billions hundreds of billions in there why not give farmers the folks who are producing our food the folks that franklin roosevelt knew were super important to this country why can't we take care of them in that way. I think it would be really smart. It would be good business. It'd be good business. Yeah. And then when you look at how much land farmers are in charge of, are stewards of, then you realize how much they're connected to wildlife and either in a good way or a bad way, depending on how they're farming, right? If they're spraying a lot of chemicals, that's not very good for anybody, including themselves. If they're regeneratively grow, growing their food, raising their cattle, they're going to create habitat for wildlife. And so then all of a sudden that becomes a cascading benefit, right? 
You know, you get farmers making money, the rural economy picks back up. You get wildlife habitat. Who knows what nature wants to do? We know we've been blocking nature for hundreds of years, especially the last hundred years. So who knows what nature wants to do? You know, I was on a farm with Alan when we were filming Roots So Deep. We were at John Lyon's place in Alabama, and he was just looking around as the sun was setting. He said, can you imagine what this looked like 500 years ago? Can you imagine how many birds were here, how many animals were here? Could we ever get that back? You know, that, that kind of, what can we do? How good can nature be? So those are my motivations. Those are my motivations now. It goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning. Just get to know these people and you have a special place for them. And it just, it's, you see the struggles and also what it could be, you know, like what it could be if we were doing things right. So for me, through the health lens with, with cancer and my son, that's, that's my passion. And so I just kind of like to see, you know, why, why, uh, somebody else would take the time and money and effort to promote something that, the end of the day doesn't really benefit you directly, right? But it's that it's that mission, right? You mm-hmm. know, and uh, that's at least that's where I find myself, Peter. Well, I think the benefit to me directly is living on a planet that's healthy, right? I think the Fair. benefit to me directly is leaving a planet in better shape for my kids and grandkids and great grandkids, right? So there's a direct benefit there. Um, the idea that you know. The, the the hardship you've dealt with with having a boy get cancer diagnosed at age five and now he's nine and he's been clean for a few years. That's awesome that that's the truth. You just told me that. Um, now, another key person on our team is a fellow named Russ Conser. I met Russ after I met Alan. Russ was working at Shell Oil, running a thing called Shell Game Changer where they could get sort of the weird ideas and bring them inside the company it was like a catcher's mitt for external ideas to bring them in if they made sense. So this idea of drawing down carbon at scale while helping farmers and ranchers was a compelling idea to him. But the reason it was compelling to him was his dad had just died and Russ was doing the research because he's a very research oriented, thoughtful human being. And he was discovering that what we eat affects our health. And he hadn't really had that connection in his life before in his, in his awareness. And so because of that health connection with Russ is a very key ingredient to why I'm here talking to you right now and, and all the success of our science team that he's a part of, the film that he's a part of. And so health was a big uh, indicator for him to go down this road. And for me, when I look at solutions, if you can come in through human health, if you can come in through wildlife, if you could come in through worrying about water cycling, I come in worrying about climate change. If the solution allows you to come in from all those different doors, it's a good solution. And so that's that's really what I feel strongly about with regenerative uh, grazing, regenerative farming. It just makes sense on all fronts. I agree. I love it. Um, and, and now so we have Pete- the data. Now we have really hard data that just proves it. So that's exciting too you're you're proving it so where where did that transition for you happen coming through that climate change lens kind mm-hmm. of the traditional narrative is that cattle are actually causing agriculture is causing climate change so how mm-hmm. did you come to the point to where you questioned that to where cattle may actually be the solution that's a great question so in the making of our film carbon nation we were sort of uh of two minds we we th- we're told that cows are bad for the planet and we actually had had some like go meatless Monday, right? So that you don't, you know, just that kind of thing. But I was also learning from like the Rodale Institute and, and John Wick out in California that grazing could be a benefit. So I was sort of getting both of those in the making of that movie. And then when we were out on the road for about three years promoting that movie, I I kept hearing about this grazing as a positive, not that all grazing was a positive, but this type of grazing. And then um, I saw Alan Savory's TED talk and what he was saying there about how you can reverse desertification. Like, okay, let's listen, let's talk more. And I got to meet him and, and learn more about that. But it was being on Alan Williams farm in, in Starkville, Mississippi with a camera talking to Alan 
and then going up to Neil Dennis's farm in Saskatchewan, or if they call it a ranch up there, I think they call it a ranch, and then coming down to Gabe Brown's operation in, in, um, in Bismarck, that trip, those three places and those three people, that's when it really showed me the power of what they were doing and how much healthier their land was than their neighbors. You could smell the difference. You could hear the difference, the birds, the bugs. The soil was actually more squishy. It wasn't so hard packed. Everything was better on those farms than across the fence. And that's when I was like, okay, something's going on here. Something's going on here. So that's why I wanted to go down this road. Let's do the research. Let's find out the metrics for what's going on here. And then I kept meeting more farmers, got to meet you know, uh, Will Harris, got to go film him. I met Doug Peterson, got to go film him. And, and just, you know, we made 10 of those short films and, and each farm, each ranch had virtually the same story. We were in trouble. We had to change. We changed. It worked. Streams that used to be dry are now running. We're out of debt. Our animals are healthier. Our operating expenses are greatly reduced. We're selling the animals for more money and we're producing more animals on the same land with the same rainfall than we did before. Just boom, 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 boom. In all sorts of different ecosystems, high mountain desert in, in New Mexico to super, super rainy Devon and Cornwall in the UK. Like just the whole swath of very different ecosystems. It's working for all these folks. So we knew it was working for the farmers, but we wanted to see if it was working for all these other things that a lot of people are worried about. So what what do you say to the uh, I mean argument? I still hear conventional farmers regularly say it just well it won't work it, yeah. it won't work at scale it won't work at my farm it won't mm -hmm. work for X Y Z. Yeah, I like the way Alan takes care of this at the Soil Health Academy uh, classes workshops. He says there's only one rule here: you cannot say this won't work on my farm, but you can ask how can this work on my farm, right? And I call it the yeah, but syndrome, right? So that's why we made films in all these different ecosystems to keep educating me and learning, will it work in the desert? Yes. Will it work in the mountains? Yes. Will it work in, in super wet England? Yes. Will it work in a drought in Kansas? Yes. And, and so that yeah, but syndrome, scientists say it, farmers say it, and, you know, so I just say, I think it will. I think it will work. Um, the extreme of that was when I was filming um, uh, it's a short film called During the Drought. And it's on our website. It's on our Carbon Cowboys website, carboncowboys.org. And Michael Thompson is the young farmer that's sort of the star of that film. And, um, and he had a field that he had been grazing and then growing corn on. And he and his neighbor, his neighbor had not been grazing that field at all. It was just planting corn conventionally. They planted at the same time. They didn't even have a fence between their two pieces of land. And by the time I got there in July, Michael's corn was much richer, deeper green, much taller. And his neighbor said, yeah, but you got more rain than I did. <laughs> right? And, yeah. so, and so everyone feels that way. And I think that's just okay for someone to feel like that because, I mean, change is hard, you know, to change the way you farm. That's a big deal. That cannot be under, under, underestimated the difficulty of change with something. Especially when it's multi-generational. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So most of the adaptive farmers that we filmed in our research, they were first generation farmers. And so they didn't have the legacy of method, but they also didn't have all those lessons that could be learned too. Like, so it was, it was sort of a double-edged sword for them, but they didn't, they just didn't feel right when people were telling them how to graze conventionally, it just didn't feel right to them because they didn't have that legacy. And, um, and their neighbors were curious. And that's what another thing that, that we discovered in our research is the conventional neighbors are curious what's going across the fence. They might not be, they might not want to ask, they might be just too polite to ask. And a lot of times the adaptive farmers don't want to tell other people what to do. They don't want to be seen as that person. And so there's this lack of communication that 
could actually be bridged pretty easily if we just sort of get in there and say, hey, do you want to know more about that? Yeah, I would like to know more about that. And that's what we did in our film is we did that kind of nudging. You know, do you want to know more about this? Do you want to talk to your neighbor about this? You do? Okay, cool. We'll, we'll be back next month and we'll film it on the porch. So that experience you had that just kind of changed the whole paradigm for you was experiencing it, actually yeah. being out there. So like the next best thing is to create content, to create the documentaries that you can share with somebody that, that maybe they can't go out there. Yeah. What, what are the communities across these, I mean, uh, the world that you've been to, how are they supporting or not supporting? What, what is that like? You know, when I've been filming the farmers, I really don't, I haven't really experienced their community with them. Um, but as we've gone out showing the movies this last, since June, I'm getting a sense of community. And what I'm finding is the folks who've been out there doing adaptive re grazing have felt very alone sometimes because they haven't had the community. And then they come to a screening where there's a bunch of other people who are having the same experience they're having. So community is being formed. And then when we have the conventional farmers there who are going, man, I just did not know about this. I didn't know. It sure does look good to me. And I like what you're saying. I like the fact that there's more birds. I like the fact that the rain's staying on the land. I like the idea of spending a lot less money on inputs. Um, you can see the community forming right in front of you eyes. And so we've been really lucky. We have this amazing social media team that are teaching me on a daily basis. I don't know anything about social media. Uh, I'm learning. Um, but we've been filming at all the Q&As after our screenings. We've been filming farmers at different conferences. And when we post their experiences online, a lot of people are watching them. Like our social media, we just went over 6.5 million views since August of the various clips cumulative, like all put together on the different social channels. And so if folks want to see our social stuff, it's at Carbon Cowboys. But that's the community that you ask about community. I, th I think it's forming. I think, I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think there's a lot of work that has been done. But what I'm seeing is um, I'm seeing real time community building right now. It's exciting. It, it feels good. And you know, and so many people say, you know, the cattle are ruining the planet and, you know, conventional cattle production, you know, I'm not going to say that's the great way to go when, when we know that adaptive, regenerative could save the farmer's money, right? And so, so there's just, there's just so much opportunity to help people, to help farmers. And, and the idea is just to present information, let the farmer make the decision. I hope it never is mandated. I think that'd be just horrible. Yeah, no, we, we don't need to need to go down that road. The uh, <laughs> as far as Arkansas goes, we have uh, seen rural Arkansas die and it is uh, really it's really sad. And when we went down and visited Will, it was the opposite, right? By mm -hmm. by refocusing on the local. Uh, now, granted, he does have, you know, the online and works with grocery stores and stuff, too. But he's still yeah. been able to vertically integrate the farm and the processing and the sales right there and, and provide jobs. So yep. where where do you see that localization uh, going and, and where where do you think that is that is this awareness, creating this awareness, kind of that first step to encourage more of the localization? I think for me, the more people understand that what they eat is their health and that when they realize that cheap food isn't necessarily healthy food, and when you put your healthcare costs in the same bucket as your food costs, that cheap food doesn't look so cheap anymore. I think that connection will help drive people out to farms and drive people to go pick which, where they want their food. Now there's there's the issue right now of a lot of that food's more expensive, so it it's elitist, right? You know the regular folks can't afford to eat like that. So I think I think making regenerative food much more the norm is how this will happen, whether it's local 
or if it's just that the grocery store chains are, are just sort of if the consumers demand it and and will agree to pay more i think you get action if they don't agree to pay more then i think it's going to be a slower a slower road um so i i don't know where it's all going to go to be honest with you i just know that if we incentivize incentivize farmers to focus on soil health it's good for everybody everybody peter how do you balance the uh small business owner that uh, it is going to create that localized food system versus the corporations the conglomerate i mean i'm i'm in arkansas i'm in walmart world mm -hmm. right so like i i see both sides of that how do you balance that from a you know the content creation and the the funding and and the institution that you're a part of so when we were fundraising for this for this work uh McDonald's was our biggest funder. And some people will say, hey, of course McDonald's is going to say meat production is good. That's their core business. But what really has happened with our research is we're showing McDonald's and a lot of other big meat producers that their methods are not the right way to go writ large, that they have to change. And so, and so, yeah, McDonald's funded us, but we're showing them that, guess what? Your supply chain is at risk. And if your farmers start doing regenerative practices, you'll have a more resilient supply chain. And so it's not like the the companies are using us to greenwash. We wouldn't allow that, right? It wouldn't do anybody good, but they're actually finding out through our research that, oh, wow, the way these few farmers are doing it is a much more resilient, climate resilient, water security resilient, food security resilient way of producing food. And then you build that up and you realize that's national security issue right there. I mean, a country that can produce its own food, that's a safe country, right? A country that can export more food than it actually eats, that's good business. And so to me, the case for soil health being really important to companies is what I've been working on for 10 years. Whether they're a food company or even an oil company, energy company, a tech company, because everybody who works there is eating food, right? And so if you don't have a healthy workforce, that's bad business. If you don't have a healthy ecosystem to do your business, that's bad business. And so Connecting those dots and getting more awareness there has been a big sort of through line for my team's work, like I said, for, for a decade now. So how do you how do you balance that with such extreme perceptions on these topics? How because I feel like you've done an incredible job of being a connector versus making things more divided. Well, I appreciate you saying that, and that's something that's really important to everyone I work with. Um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, about 20 years ago, I was going through a divorce and, and I was very blamey, right? It's all her fault. Blah. And it didn't feel good and it wasn't healthy. And he said, you know, the Cherokee have this expression, no blame, no shame. And I don't know how to say it in Cherokee, but the idea. And it was an amazing piece of advice, an amazing piece of wisdom that my friend Luke Phillips from South Carolina gave me. And I've tried to put that into all the work we're doing. Carbon Nation. Our tagline for Carbon Nation was a climate change solutions movie that doesn't even care if you believe in climate change, right? That these are good ideas, no matter what you believe. Um, Saving money by using less energy to get the beer cold? Why not, right? Do you want to give a kid asthma for your cold beer? Or do you want to have clean air and still have a cold beer? You know, that's how you look at it. And so that taught me a lot of how to communicate with folks without being blamey and saying, you did this and you did that. This is all your fault and blah, blah, blah. And so in all of our work, we come at it as just that we don't blame we just don't and and people i know i listen 
if someone's not pointing the finger at me. And so why yeah. wouldn't that be the same for people that I'm talking with? And once you do this, like just a gentle, respectful listening, like I was telling my boys the other night, I don't know if they'll remember it or maybe they will when they're 40 or I don't know, but I was saying, you know, listening is one of the most respectful things you can do for another human being. It's a gift to give to someone, to listen to them, really listen. And my wife, Krishna, she's the best at it by far. She's taught me how to listen. She actually remembers what I said. You know what I mean? She listens. And when you feel listened to, you feel loved, you feel uh, uh, um, uh, validated, you, you feel heard. And I think such a big part of our country's, and I'll, I'll put it in quotes, division right now, because I think it's a lot of... I think it's a lot of lies that people are buying that we are divided um, is because we're not getting the chance to listen to folks and we're not giving the chance to be heard. And so, you know, all the farmers I work with, most of the farmers, we, we probably vote differently, but we're friends. That's the way it should yeah. be. Okay. Yeah. You've got some differences. Great. Let's celebrate the differences. Maybe we can learn from each other, um, but we don't point fingers. We talk about soil health, you know, and that's, that is a great uh, connector right there. Soil health is a great connector for anybody. I've never heard anyone say, I don't buy that. I don't want that. <laughs> never heard that. And so that's how it's, we, uh, that's how we communicate. We, we communicate with respect. I mean, I feel like you were you were describing Dale Carnegie's work, really. Uh, just uh, it was it was wonderful. I think you, you could give a whole class on how we communicate, you know, this way, uh, and then be the new Dale Carnegie. I think that's beautiful, <laughs> and I think that's probably why you're having an impact. No, well, it's 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 cool to see people um, appreciate the approach. I'll tell you that it feels good to me. It it does, and, and that the, that war I've said it you know many times throughout our our interviews and stuff is the war on any nothing has worked right the war on drugs the war on cancer the war on anything it, it just hasn't and that's why you know I called this sowing prosperity I feel like by shining a light that's how we get rid of that darkness focusing on the things that create prosperity those other things just kind of go away um, and that's I I just I resonate with what you're saying, brother. I love it. I'm excited to have uh, had the opportunity to meet you and uh, know that you know there's there's so many of us out here trying. So many, uh, and so many. Logan, and, I'm telling just, you, we're not alone at all. And 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 what what your podcast does and what social media is showing me in a positive way because social media can also be a weapon in a negative way. But we're we're seeing community building. And, um, and look, you took a, you took, you know, sometimes it takes a shock to the system to wake us up. You had a shock to your system, your, your family, right. And health. And, um, and for me, it was learning about climate change and going, holy crap, this is a big deal, right? That was my shock. And, and the fact that your shock and my shock could lead us to soil health. I just find that fascinating, fascinating and encouraging. And encouraging. Yeah. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, what's next for you, brother? What uh, what can we do to help support? I know you've mentioned Appreciate some that. of the websites and stuff. So what yeah. do we what do we do next? Uh, our social media handle across the board is at Carbon Cowboy. So come check us out there. Our website is rootsodeep.org. Sign up for our newsletter. Be part of our, our team. Help us help you, right? Now we've got enough social media following that we can help other groups, right? And so, um, and so if, if a group needs the word out on something along these lines, contact us. We'll be happy to sing your song. Happy to. And um, like there's this group called the Environmental, the Evangelical Environmental Network, E-E-N. And they're interviewing Gabe Brown tomorrow. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to text my, uh, email my social team right now and say, hey, can we just support that? We haven't asked the per permission. We're just going to put it out there and say, check this out. This is going to be good. And because um, I, do, I do think that the idea of being a good steward of the earth is a powerful message for a lot of people. 
and and um, it's a it's a, another place of common ground of common thinking of of you know. So let's let's celebrate that, right? Let's celebrate that. So so that's what what it is. Our website, our social, and just come join us and uh, see where this thing goes, man. And how can we help you? You, you know, when you get this up, we we'll, we'll push this out. We'd be we'd be thrilled to do that. Well, thank you, thank you, my friend. And I, I have thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed uh, the visit and the the time. I look forward to seeing what uh, what comes next. And uh, man, enjoy enjoy you some Arizona weather. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Logan. Thanks for reaching out, man. I really appreciate it. Good to know you. Good to meet you. Thank you for joining us on Sowing Prosperity. Be sure to follow along across the social media platforms, including YouTube, and be sure to go to sowingprosperity.com.